the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. In the studio with us is Cynthia Parks and Kenneth Carlson. Director Cynthia Parks was born in Long Beach, and as she says, was whisked away to the south for several years. <laughs> she came back to California and graduated from Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz, and then stayed there for a while. What kept you in Santa Cruz? Well, basically just the town itself and the physical environment. It's so stunningly beautiful there. And I taught preschool for years, so I was just had a life there. And, and you just stayed? Well, I just stayed. What made you become a director? Well, I s started studying theater and acting, and um, about six years into that, I started <coughs> directing, first assistant directing, and then went on. Did this all take place in Santa Cruz? All took place in Santa Cruz. Is there enough theater there to keep you busy? Well, eventually there was because I ended up starting my own theater company because I wanted to direct the kind of shows that, you know, I wanted to do that had some impact socially and emotionally on people. Prior to that, though, Cynthia, you were <laughs> acting. <laughs> yes. Were you acting in stage productions there, actually acting? Well, I acted in a few, very few, because I was ever so nervous to be on stage, as I still am to this day, because it's just too much for me. So I would never go to auditions, because that's, that's the most nerve-wracking thing going on. So. So if you don't go to auditions, you don't get <laughs> cast, right? You don't act, exactly. <laughs> well, so directing was a better choice for me. Does, does, is there uh, some kind of, um, I know, something against women being directors? We don't have very many directors. Women, women directors. directors. <laughs> we have a lot of directors, I know. I know. Um, was it a problem for me? No, not at all. I. Why don't more women go into directing then? I don't know. Then? I mean, I knew a few women in Santa Cruz. Who were? Directors. So. Were they part of your group? Because you, tell us about right. the group that you started, there Central. There was Central Coast Theater Works in Santa Cruz. Um, actually, the three main women that started it, and one of them is the head of Cabrillo College um, Arts, Theater Arts Department, she is a woman director, and that's who I learned to direct from. I mean, oh. I was her assistant director in um, Durang's Laughing Wild. So I was taught from her. So I've always been around women directors. And then when you started the uh, group, the theater group, uh -huh. uh, did it encompass everything? It encompassed... Or just... Uh, no, it encompassed directors, actors, tech people. So basically there was about nine of us in the beginning. So was it like an ensemble? It was basic ensemble. And wouldn't you, you were in Northern California in Santa Cruz, so wouldn't there be more theater for you to go to in, say, San Francisco or to Los Angeles? Well, actually in San Francisco, is, there's not a lot of theater going on except like the big musicals. Huh. There's not like a lot of small theater. There and isn't. We no. have more in LA. I Absolutely. So. I think um, the idea of small theater is so important, and I think it's a really good testing ground for actors. Right, I agree. So you wouldn't take your plays that you did in Santa Cruz and go to um, San, San Francisco, Francisco or, or New York? Well, financially, I couldn't afford to do that. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me about the challenges in directing. For, how do you start with the play? Well, I read the script and dissect that and s see, you know, if I even want to direct it, what it's, what's the push there and what it says to me emotionally. And, and then do you talk to other people about it or? Um, no, it's, oh, it's kind of a personal thing with me and I never have an assistant director actually. I always work alone. And on my recent show, I didn't even pull a stage manager in until the bitter end, so I worked one-on-one -on -one with my actor for about a year and a half, actually. You've um, directed a lot of really male-driven 
pieces like Oleana, David Mamet's Oleana, and Bent, right. and uh, Vincent, and they really are like strong men in those uh, plays. How do you handle that? Well, I handle it, I think, just from a human aspect because... Talk about Bent first because that was, that's pretty... Uh, intense. Intense. It was, uh, <laughs> Uh, persecution of homosexuals in Nazi Germany. So, it was an all-male cast. Uh, you directed. Yeah. No, actually, there were a couple women in it. Were there? Like in the group scenes. I see. In the train scenes and so forth. But yeah. how, how do you get your actors to move around in something like that and, and feel those things oh. because they really are men's uh, emotions? Right. Well. Um, I use a lot of improv in my directing, mm -hmm. and I find that's very helpful. So that means the actor can interpret? Right. <laughs> now, let, now, let's talk about Vincent, <clears throat> because it's a story about Vincent Van Gogh. Tell us a little bit about that. Sam Lovett plays um, two roles. <laughs> right. He plays his brother Teo and Vincent, and it, the play begins a week after Vincent's death. And Teo's extremely broken up about it and wants to tell some things about Vincent, which he couldn't do at his funeral. And the story unfolds and Vincent, you know, he becomes Vincent and he goes in and out of both characters throughout the play. Well, how did you decide that Sam should go in and out of two characters? Why not just have one character tell it? Well, the script is both characters, but in the script written by Leonard Nimoy, he never it says to the actor never to really lay claim to Vincent, where I have had him completely lay claim to Vincent because of all the research I did with Vincent, and I just love him, and I want people to know him like he, I've gotten to know him. There was so much to know about him. I, I know. think the public is really uh, has a misconception of what he did and how he did it and how sensitive he really was. Oh. We hear little things, but we yeah. don't see it. When you worked with, with Sam Lovett on stage, obviously it's a one-person play, did you work with the lighting director too? Because the lights change and well, come and go. My lighting designer, who's also from Santa Cruz, came down to do this show. I've worked with him for years on all my shows. So he knows what to expect? And he had the script and came down for our tech week and just came in and did it. Well, how do you move Sam around the stage? He's moving all the time. Well, just by the motivation of his character. I mean, he needs to go to Vincent's area and or, I don't know how I would explain that exactly. Um, but is, is there choreography involved in it? I mean, like in my mind's eye? Yeah, because it's a visual thing. So, um, yeah, it's a movement, it's a dance, it's a dance. The whole, all shows are, I think. It, do you think that's what happens with these one-person plays? I always think that you've got one person standing on stage, and as you say, this dance has to move. You have certain, obviously, you had certain sections in your mind right. of the stage. I have never done, this is my first one-man show, so, um, I don't know, it's just, I don't know. What about the set design? You did that too. I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to design my sets because I think it's an extension of the direction and it's the feel and and I ch made some bold choices. <clears throat> excuse me, as not to use slides, which is written in the script. Ah. So, and instead using these paintings, which are, is like the big surprise at the end right. of the play. Right. Right. And we so we don't need to go any further on that, but. <laughs> <Right. it is. laughs> but do you think you you looked at you looked at Vincent? Um, as maybe a woman who had fallen in love with him? With Vincent? Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe. It's hard to say because I do love him. I mean, I actually adore him and we're actually kind of a lot alike because we're both kind of intense. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> Did you think he could have been a director? Maybe you could be a painter. I don't think so. <laughs> I think I've got you painting. Uh. We were talking earlier about um, going <laughs> going to another really male-driven play, Oleana. Right, that Oleana. You, that did by, about four years ago, yes. By David Mamet. Mm -hmm. And th there's so many different ways to interpret that. Were you sensitive or uh, more sensitive to the to the student in that? I, I don't think I was. I think I was um, 
sensitive to both of them and just came from a very human perspective of both parties being misunderstood. Tell a little bit about the plot. I, I didn't explain it. Um, the professor and a student and she asks for help in sexual harassment charges, gets slapped on him, he loses his job and so it's just this, you know. But it starts out very innocently. Absolutely, and I think that truly that he was just trying to help her and she was, you know, had these people pushing her or so it's insinuated. Mm -hmm. Of pushing her to, to, to attack. Attack, and that's, that's the direction I took it in. Well, but, but you say she wasn't the professor you believed. Right. So that's, that's your interpretation. Absolutely. That's what I want to know what the director really does. He just takes a script and interprets it. Right. I saw a cryptogram in New York and I saw it here. And director, two different directors. Yeah, it was like a different play. It's total interpretation. That's so all it is. I think the audience <laughs> should know, should look for, at the person who's directing it and go see something maybe once or twice or three times because it's always different. Always. Uh, we um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> for coming on <laughs> and for telling us a little bit about it because you know, it's difficult to, to really know what a director does. You I don't know. just go point, 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 do right. you? Right, no. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Thank and you. And Cynthia Parks, good luck. We'll see you soon. Okay. Don't go away because we'll be right back with filmmaker Ken Carlson. Hi, we're back and I'm Joan Quinn here with director, producer, writer Kenneth Carlson who was born and raised in Ohio somewhere in the middle of this country. <laughs> After graduating from Brown in 1986 he started his own production company. How did you start a production company right out of college? Well, I was in Washington DC and there was a lot of need for for uh, dull, boring corporate, uh, you know, videos and, oh, and such things. Oh, is that what Yeah, so, so I, uh, I, I started uh, in Washington D.C. doing those very, very kind of things, you know, and in informational kind of things, and then worked my way into commercials and, and to shorts, and uh, and then to America's Most Wanted. So that was actually a good thing for you then. Being oh, yeah. it, it, Gave you a uh, chance to have a job in Washington. Oh yeah, no, it was, Did it was you fantastic think of staying training there? Ground. Did you think of staying there? Oh, I love Washington D.C. I absolutely love it. I I, I miss uh, elements of Washington D.C. without a doubt. I mean, the it's a cultural hub. Obviously, the heartbeat of the of the country is there. And um, I loved uh, walking on the mall and and uh, taking in. Uh, the Smithsonian's, uh, it's just a cultural mecca. It Love is it. wonderful, isn't it? It's, it, it makes you proud to be an American. Absolutely. I, it's just like the best place. We go to Europe to see these wonderful things, and Washington, D.C., I think, is the epitome of everything we've seen anywhere we've traveled. I agree. I think it's the closest to a European city that we have that you can actually walk. I know, and it's really... Although I wouldn't recommend walking <laughs> at night in some parts. But you didn't stay in Washington very long. You must have had bigger plans. Well, so six and a half years, but Hollywood did call. I was were there for you? A while. You, oh, Absolutely. you were there? Quite well, one of the reasons America's Most Wanted is headquartered in uh, in Washington D.C. Oh, that's how. You, oh, yeah. you started working on the show. Got to be close to the FBI and the CIA, so there the files are all right there. And ah. and uh, one of the lone uh, production companies outside of Hollywood that has uh, uh, a big, uh, you know, uh, a reality-based show here. Um, so much of the work that they do is on the in, you know on the East Coast, so uh, it, it was it's a perfect place to set up shop. Although they are a production island, they really didn't know what you know how it how to you know produce. Was it all being produced there, or were they calling you for segments? Oh, did you segments. get segments and the, get them the, done there the, in the Washington? The show shot there in Washington D.C. The show is actually it's shot, shot there. You know the John Walsh, the stand-ups. You know I they're see. they're mostly there. I see. All the I stage see. work, but then the segments come from well wherever there's crime, and as we know, there's I crime see. everywhere. How long did you do that? I did that for four years. And, and that was did, a great training ground. Did, did you, all the time you were there, were you thinking about doing longer pieces, uh, documentaries, or 
uh, a feature film. What was on your mind while you were doing these little segments? Well, I sh <laughs> you, you just covered them all, so I can't, I can't answer that question now. Tell me. Um, it was a great training ground because America's Most Wanted would hand over a, you know, a, 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 a large budget, ninety, one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and say, go shoot uh, this on film and, and come back in two or three weeks. Did that take you throughout the United States or oh, to Europe yeah. as well? I've been to to about every uh, every uh, state in our union because of that show. Is that right? And I think I'm responsible for 41 criminals being uh, put behind bars because <laughs> of the show. Hey, you know, it's it's uh, it, it's pretty. It, 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 the great thing about America's Most Wanted is I, had, I got practical uh, production experience. That's great. And I was able to better our society. I mean, what, what a great combination. Is that the kind of thing when you're making a, a movie and they call it uh, second camera work, second uh, director? Mean B unit, second camera? Yeah. Is that the kind of thing, the experience that you were getting? Oh, no. I mean, I was, they would give me money and I would go out and produce, write, and direct uh, you know, the segment. So I would hire you know, 70 people and I, we would shoot on 16 millimeter. So I would write, uh, a lot of times I would write the scripts or we'd have uh, writers in house. Oh, so um, it wasn't going out and shooting stuff that was going on and bringing it back to a bigger production. You were doing the production. We were doing the production. We I shot see. recreations, uh, reenactments. So we would hire uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, actors to do it and, and we'd hire uh, the production companies uh, a lot of times. And so it was a production within itself, a 15 minute see. segment. And there was four acts four reenactments uh, essentially in each uh, each show so I it was see. a great training ground. I didn't understand that. Did that actually open the door then for documentaries because these were real episodes that you were dealing with. Absolutely. Honest situations. Yeah. And great stories and that's as we know in Hollywood a lot of those stories uh, uh, sell, you know, for movie of the weeks and and uh, and and, and each, even feature films. Did you so ever do that? Them. Did you ever do that? Did you ever think of any of those stories that you had done that you would, could come in then and make them bigger and absolutely. make them? Absolutely, you did. Absolutely, and there's there's a couple that we have going right now that I think will will uh, eventually be seen on uh, on the big screen or perhaps uh, on a movie of the week kind of format. So that really was your stepping stone into documentation, documentary. Did mm -hmm. I read in one of the clips that said, don't call him a documentarian? Do you mind being called oh, a no, documentarian? Oh, no, I love it. It's a complimentary. I'm very proud of the work that I've done. And, and uh, uh, no, it's, it used to be uh, documentary work was for those, the passionate and the penniless, you know. And, but exactly. now the format has has a lot more, uh, it's a lot higher profile. I mean, you know, you go to, uh, and I think part of the reason is Robert Redford, you know, at Sundance, he really, um, he really has brought the, uh, the reputation of documentaries, uh, documentarians up a bit, and uh, we owe him a great deal for a lot of our, uh, uh, you know, our, our everyday film uh, usage now. We, we really owe him. He's but, but also the A&E channel, I mean, and the mm. History Channel, it's really something that's on top of the list now. Yeah. And the idea is of really creating something different. Mm -hmm. I, I was talking to uh, the director doing a one-person play, and you always have to think of some kind of thing to motivate this actor or make it different for the audience. And documentaries, you can bring so many different aspects into them. Oh, yeah, just think. Right now, you're absolutely right. And Ken Burns also pushed that format into the forefront, which uh, we owe him uh, a great deal as well. But uh, anybody can get a high heat camera now and go out and shoot incidents on the fly. You know, I mean, they could shoot this show as we are speaking and make a documentary out of it, and it's it is a it has a life of its own. And the way they put it together, I oh, guess, yeah. is what it really is. Well, that's what it is. You know, how you take all uh, how you assemble the pieces. That's that's really what a documentarian does, and that's that's a real gift. And that's, and that's a lot of And work. it does come to a lot of writing. I always thought documentaries oh, sure. just happen by themselves, but you have to write that script and get each person plugged into the right place. You Absolutely. became really famous as a famous documentarian when you uh, wrote Wild Bill Hollywood Maverick. Wild Bill Hollywood Maverick, that's right. Right, and that's about William Wellman. Great William Wellman. And William I, Augustus Wellman. And I bet I couldn't name you I know William Wellman's name, but I couldn't mm. name you one movie that he did. I think people got William That's Wellman. That's why we did it. That's, is that That's right? That's why we did it. Because people uh. get him mixed up with Billy Wilder, William Wyler. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilder. Wilder. Wilder and Wilder, yes. But and Wellman was, he was dropped. working at the same time? Absolutely. And he was contemporaries with them. 
I, I, I know the name because uh, some of his, his daughters went to the girls' school that right. I went to. So we were aware of William Wellman, but I think the public doesn't know about him. So you have to tell us a little bit about it. Well, William Wellman, um, he, he was a director uh, from the early 20s until the late 50s. And uh, he was responsible for some of the greatest films. Um, but like you said, we don't really know his name. We get confused with Wilder and Wilder and, and others, actually. Um, and that's one of the reasons, that is the reason we did uh, this documentary, because it was an unknown. So it was a gem. It was a gem in the rough, you know, and it was uh, great to uh, explore. And as a, as a filmmaker, I was able to uh, learn so much about my craft, and I came away with uh, a great, a great sense of pride. This man was responsible for the first, uh, uh, first film to win uh, an Oscar. Is uh, that Wings. Right? What was it? Wings, oh, 1929, Wings. silent okay. film, and he made the transition, <coughs> which a lot of directors couldn't do, from silence to talkies. Uh, so he did that. I mean, he did the High and the Mighty. He did the Oxbow Incident, Yellow Sky, Nothing Sacred. Um, one of my favorites, uh, The Public Enemy. All of the movies we know, and yeah. all of the movies that mm -hmm. are replayed and replayed on TV, yes. right? But, but Wellman's name doesn't jump to the forefront. That's right. Well, he was the not a household do. name. He did not, he did not focus on, on getting himself known. He was not a commodity. He considered himself a craftsman. He he wasn't on a tour that and wanted to be known for that. Like, for instance, a Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. We think of Hitchcock, we think of suspense. <coughs> and he, you know, Hitch, you know, he was really, he was really a high-profile person. He had a publicist, several, and he wanted to create a persona that we would all remember. And he did. Capra, another example. Yeah, this, Frank Capra. These men knew what they were doing and wanted to become personalities, and did, and were known for a certain niche, a certain genre. But Wellman, uh, he did it all. I mean, he, he literally made romances, comedies, dramas, I mean, his war films, you know, his social, political um, content films. I mean, it's, he did everything. And so he didn't get pigeonholed, and he didn't get known for one specific kind of film. And so his name's been lost. Let's see a clip. Until now. Let's see a clip from that. Right. Okay? Mm hmm there are perhaps many ways to measure the totality of a man's life. William Wellman's body of work is surely a tribute to who he was and what he accomplished. But ultimately, it may be unimportant whether the man is remembered. He certainly would have shrugged off the notoriety. What is more significant is the sum total of his experience, the power of his personality, and how it filled each frame of his work. To see the world in the aspect ratio of popular culture through the ground glass of men such as Wellman is to gain insight into who we all are, where we have been, and where we might go in the future. Wellman himself was not so self-conscious or introspective. He just made pictures. That is so great. I know you, you nice. worked with so many celebrities on this. I, how'd you get them all? Uh, William Wellman, Wellman Jr. was uh, essential in that because he, of course, still had contacts with uh, Richard Widmark, Redford, all of, the, uh, all of the celebrities that we have in this. He really was, was hands-on. Plus, we knew a few. We brought a few in ourselves. So they wanted to be on camera talking about Wellman. Yeah, there was everybody we contacted, just about everybody. I won't mention the people who didn't. But no, don't talk about that. I think you have a lot of documentaries left in you. I hope so. I do. I think so, Now, the, the other thing that's so interesting is from documentaries to a full... Uh, full-length feature film that you wrote, directed, 
And did you produce, co-produce, yes. produce? Yeah, produced. Um, so tell us about that. I'll never do it again. <laughs> Is that right? It's no, easier will, with documentaries. Uh, well, the documentaries catch as catch come, you know, uh -huh. uh, and, and, and it's it's catching incidents on the fly a lot of the times, although there is an organization to it. But, you know, feature film work, it's you have to be on top of your game each and every day. And when you write, produce, and direct something, uh, especially for the first time, uh, it is it is a huge workload. I really enjoy it. Tell us it, the it's name tough. of it. It's uh, Special Delivery. Call it Special Delivery. Special Delivery, Sean Young, Penny Marshall, Nell Carter. Paul Dooley, Jerry Burns, a whole list, and my lovely wife, Katrina Carlson. That's right. And let me just read one thing. Um, Robert Shear in the LA Times said, the movie was a pleasant surprise. Like Woody Allen with the Jews, Carlson has taken the fables of his tribe and made it the stuff of provocative comedy. How about that? That's it's great to have Person a friend in the media. Tribe. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting. Do you think we have time to just see a really quick clip I hope it. so, yeah. Okay, let's just see a really fast, short clip of All Special right. Delivery. Here we go. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together in the sight of God and in the face of this company. Therefore, marriage ought not to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, discreetly, soberly, and in the fear of God. Greetings, Allie. The Lord is with you. These two persons and also come now to be joined. That in the beginning God created mankind, male and female, and Rejoice. Men, you are highly and favored. To live together honorably From and now on, all generations shall call you blessed. Excuse me? God created husband and wife to live honorably in lifelong love and fidelity. Into this holy estate, these two persons Allie, come now to the be... the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You shall be a servant of the Lord. Let him speak now or forever hold his peace. Me? I'm sorry. Now, Ken, the tell ring. us what this really is about. Post setup. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, film is about uh, a, a woman uh, in her 40s who receives uh, the calling to have uh, God's child. So kind of a, a modern day uh, Mary, uh, Immaculate Conception, if you will. And Sean Young plays uh, the lead, and uh, uh, Penny Marshall is the angel who, who uh, kind of helps her out through the thing. <laughs> we have Nell Carter as the judge. And, uh, great, great people, uh, great cast, uh, wonderful to work with. It really, it's, it's really something that, I don't know, does this come from being a preacher's son? Absolutely. It did? <laughs> well, my whole life is, you know, are you saved? You know, what's going to happen, uh, you know? But that isn't, this movie isn't like that. This no, but movie it's on, is it's like today. It's like what could happen today. Yeah. It's pretty believable in a nice. way. Well, I try to make it that way. It's a fine line, you know? We didn't want to be too Billy Graham-ish. Right. And we didn't uh, certainly want to engage in blasphemy. So it was a, it was a fine yeah. It fine has that line. fantasy feel that's very yeah. popular now. And I think Penny Marshall looked like that John Travolta angel. She had the same... Uh, Angel yes. thing that John Travolta Phenomenon, did. Phenomenon, yes. Yeah, it was really